So good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to this uh, Carnegie Mellon University uh, Privacy Day uh, event. Uh, for uh, those of you who don't know me, I'm Norman Sedeb, Professor of Computer Science, also co-director of the uh, master's program in uh, privacy engineering that we just uh, launched earlier uh, this year. And uh, as part of uh, uh, this uh, special event that we're organizing uh, today here at Carnegie Mellon uh, in, uh, around privacy, uh, we've got a couple of uh, things that we've organized. Uh, one is this panel uh, that I assume you plan to attend. You're certainly in this room. Uh, you being in this room is certainly an indication that that might be your plan. And uh, following this, we have a uh, project fair where uh, we have uh, a number of uh, posters that are intended to uh, highlight a number of different activities taking place at Carnegie Mellon in the area of uh, privacy, in particular uh, cutting edge uh, research, uh, in this space, uh, projects that are looking at uh, the many different facets of data privacy today, many of them very closely related to the topic of this panel, which revolves around mobile and social uh, networking and uh, its impact or their impact uh, on privacy. We have a very uh, impressive uh, set of panelists also today uh, that I'm going to introduce in a minute. Uh, but perhaps before we get to that, I should just uh, say, for those of you who are not familiar with Privacy Day, perhaps I should just say a couple of words about uh, what Privacy Day is about. So Privacy Day is essentially an event that's now being celebrated uh, annually. This is a global event. There are events like this taking place around the world, as it turns out. And uh, the intention behind this day is obviously to raise awareness about privacy uh, and uh, to uh, gain uh, essentially or to enable people to better appreciate how evolving practices, uh, in particular in the context of the web, but also beyond, impact our privacy, uh, and uh, to better also appreciate what we can do to perhaps better protect our data and our privacy also in the context of these new scenarios. So there are multiple facets to this event. Uh, one of these facets is education and awareness. Another facet, I would say, is closely related uh, to public policy, raising also awareness in uh, public policy uh, circles about uh, potentially shortcomings in this space, how emerging practices might potentially impact existing regulations and, and uh, future laws that we might potentially want to enact. Uh, and then uh, beyond that also, to raise awareness also in industry about uh, where we are how people in general seem to feel about these emerging practices and what that might mean uh, for companies as well. So that's essentially uh, the objective of this day and the event that we're organizing today is intended to, pro to promote these, these objectives. So without any further ado, I'd like to uh, very quickly go over the program. Like I said, we're going to start with a panel, we're going to look specifically at uh, the mobile web and the social web and understand how emerging practices in that context are impacting our privacy, and then we're going to continue with a project fair starting at 3.15. Uh, the project fair also has uh, food and drinks for those of you who are uh, interested in that. So let me uh, very briefly introduce our panelists. Uh, they are all experts in, in privacy, and in particular in the area of privacy as it relates to the mobile and social webs. Uh, to my right here, I have uh, Professor uh, Jason Hong, who is a uh, professor of computer science and human-computer interaction. He's well known for uh, extensive work that he has done in mobile and social uh, privacy, and I'm sure he'll tell us more about his work as well as how he perceives this space. Uh, we have uh, Professor Travis Bro, who is also a professor of computer science with a slightly different background, focusing more on uh, formal methods and reasoning uh, frameworks that enable us to potentially uh, automate or at least semi-automate uh, techniques that are intended to uh, look, for instance, at compliance between practices and various regulations. And I'm sure he'll tell us more about what he's doing in that space. And then uh, to uh, the left here, uh, we have Professor Laurie Craner, who is a professor of computer science as well of, as uh, engineering and public pr policy. Uh, she's well known for uh, the work that she did in uh, uh, the late uh, 90s and early 2000s in the context of a framework known as the Platform for Privacy Preferences and has remained extremely active in the overall privacy space, working both on the public policy side as well as uh, the technology side of these uh, issues. And I'm sure she'll tell you more also over the course of the next hour and 15 minutes about 
her work in this area. So I want to make this uh, panel one that's uh, accessible to everyone. And so uh, the format will be one where I'm going to very strongly encourage your panelists to remain short and on the point. I've got a series of questions I'd like to ask them, but I'd like to also give you an opportunity to ask questions to our panelists and uh, hopefully in the process lead to some uh, interesting uh, discussions as well. So I'm going to start uh, by perhaps just briefly providing a bit more context on, on where we are today. Don't mean to uh, sort of uh, steal the show here. So I'm going to be fairly brief and then we'll move on to, to a few questions. So I'm sure we re realize uh, social networking has uh, clearly taken off. It's here to stay. You look at the number of uh, users, for instance, on Facebook, and it's well over a billion users today. You look at uh, the mobile web, and uh, it looks like everyone today has a smartphone. Right? These smartphones have been referred to uh, sometimes also as trackers, in part because of the amount of information that uh, they make it possible to collect about uh, their users. Uh, many apps, as we know, are available for free, and the only way in which this is possible is because the developers be be behind these apps are effectively generating revenue based on advertising, and one way of generating more revenue from advertising involves better understanding your users, your customers, and you can do that potentially by collecting more information about them. Smartphones have proven to be a wonderful source of uh, very uh, personal information about users uh, that uh, many developers are uh, in the process of exploding in various ways, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that also uh, this afternoon. So given that context, and given that we probably all have a smartphone in this room, and probably given that all of us are probably also members of one or more social networks, an obvious question comes to mind, which is obviously, well, you're telling us that you know, all this is happening today, and you hear you know, headlines uh, on a daily basis about this or that perhaps not being completely right as far as privacy is concerned, but how big of a deal is it really? Is this really something that we should be concerned about? Or is this just uh, something that looks good in the headlines, but perhaps at the end of the day, we as a society have uh, learned to just uh, uh, you know, live with what the implications of all these new practices are. And perhaps we've decided that at the end of the day, this is quite acceptable, it doesn't matter. And uh, you know, who cares? Let's all buy smartphones and let everyone track us. And so I would be curious to hear uh, from our panelists uh, what their view of this issue is. I mean, you often hear that people are saying, yes, sure, privacy. Yes, I understand. I've got a lot more information that I'm leaving behind these days, and that information is being exploited in various ways. But we're all doing that, and we all understand this by and large. So uh, perhaps starting with uh, Jason Hong, so should users really be concerned about the data collection uh, practices uh, that are enabled by the mobile and social web? And effectively, what is the worst that could happen to us? Right. So, um, thanks, Norma. I think uh, from what we've been looking at, uh, we've been studying these smartphone apps for probably a few years now, and I think the biggest surprise that people have about that when we talk about their work is just how surprised they are about how much data is being collected. I sort of get the sense that you know a lot of people we talk to know data is being collected, but they don't know how much data is being collected and what's being done with it. And I think that's the part that really scares people. So, for example, like uh, one of the studies we did recently showed that uh, a vast number of people were really surprised that you know flashlight apps are collecting your internet address as well as your location data and your phone's unique ID, and that's the part that really surprises people. And then I've even had talks where I'm telling people about this, and I see people uninstalling the apps as I'm going along just because they're so surprised at what's going on. So uh, I think that we're only at sort of the tip of the iceberg, and the main reason for this is because uh, if you don't know this already, most of the data is being used for advertising. And so we have all these apps with different kinds of business models. Either you pay 99 cents and you get the app, or you have a freemium model, or it's advertising based. And once you have this incentive for advertising, then companies have this incentive to try to collect so much data about you because they want to try to maximize their ad revenue. And so that's why so much data is being collected about us. So once we start going down that path, it's sort of like a downhill path where they just want to keep on collecting more and more data. But I'd also like to throw in one more wrench here, which is, uh, I said this is only the tip of the iceberg. One that I think hasn't happened yet, but probably will happen, is insurance companies, too. Where insurance companies are going to start trying to collect as much data about us, trying to make sure, for example, that we're eating healthier, we're driving properly, or we're maintaining our homes properly, and so on. And so I think that you know, this hasn't happened yet. We've seen lots of research projects, and I know that there's been some pilot studies on this, but I suspect that's going to be even bigger than what we've been seeing with advertising. So perhaps uh, Travis would like to uh, follow on, on his take on this. Does, does it really matter, or, or uh, are we uh, you know, perhaps overly concerned about privacy? 
No, I, I think it really does matter. And uh, just following along Jason's point, first of all, we've got, we've got the fact that these mobile phones are now in very personal spaces. We carry them with us um, in places where we wouldn't normally invite other people, like insurance companies, for example. Um, and combine that with social networking, and we now also not only have these personal spaces, but we have our personal friends, right? People, contacts that we normally keep, somewhat private, we don't share with the world, and that um, creates a recipe for potentially exposing more information about ourselves to others than we actually plan to. I would say it's also a problem because um, the types of marketplaces that are arising around these mobile phones, for example, app marketplaces, um, where developers can very easily publish an application that collects sensitive data um, that they can then store on their own web servers or, or databases um, remotely from the phone, creates a very challenging situation, in particular because the barrier to entry has now gotten lower. So if you wanted to develop um, for example, a mobile phone, you actually have to be a company like Apple or Google where you have the resources to do the manufacturing, to do the design. But if you want to write an application for a mobile phone, you can, you can be a, you know, a student within this university, you could be somebody um, in another country who doesn't understand the, the norms and, and social values where that app is actually going to be sold. So this formula creates a potentially um, privacy surprising situation where we now have to think about how do we get those developers to understand what the users' needs are, um, how do we get app marketplaces to coordinate with those users, um, all kinds of questions that I think are still yet unanswered. Thank you. Um, Laurie, would you like to add something? Um, yeah, so uh, Jason and Travis already covered a lot of what I was going to say, but um, I, I think um, adding a, what uh, Jason suggested that there'll be new parties like insurance companies that want access to this data, I think we're going to see an increasing number of, of parties. I think um, we're going to see um, companies that want this data for background checks, uh, background check information that is potentially available to employers um, and actually to anybody who wants to pay to do a background check on you. Um, so there's there's all sorts of other um, uh, types of entities who um, are probably not actually regulated um, who want to have access to this kind of information. Um, and I think that the, the lack of regulation, I think, ends up being a big problem, that it's kind of a free-for-all. Um, there's very little control over um, what what apps actually collect when they're on their on your phone, what they do with it, and then whatever data is collected, how it's further shared. Um, and so it, it's, it's kind of this big um, free-for-all, and we don't really know what is going to happen with this information and what the consequences are going to be. Uh, at some point, uh, something is going to happen um, that will probably make us all take a step back and go, oh, wow, we didn't realize that was going to happen. And at that point, it's going to be too late to very easily back out of all of this, because because we've all grown accustomed to using lots of um, really valuable and convenient services. So uh, perhaps to just stay on the same topic, and now you're starting also to touch on, on regulation, which is a topic that I would like to perhaps touch on uh, next. But uh, you know, surely one could, could, could argue that uh, you know, as a user, no one is going to force me to download an app. And so if you know, tomorrow insurance companies start developing apps that perhaps will collect more than I feel comfortable with, you know, I don't have to download these apps. I mean, couldn't I just decide that, after all, I don't feel comfortable with that, and, and, and that would be the end of the story? Well, I, I think part of the problem is that it's unlikely to be your insurance company that's going to offer you the app that collects collects the data. It's going to be some other app that you want to use, your flashlight app, your Angry Birds game, whatever, that then is going to sell data to your insurance company. And so it may not be obvious to you even which app is selling data to your insurance company um, or how you can find an alternative app that doesn't sell data to them. Okay. And I think Travis wants to add something? Definitely. So I think there's also a precedent in terms of loyalty cards. Um, it's a good example where you may not want to tell your grocery store every item you purchase on a weekly basis so that they have a compound list that, of your purchase history. But you might be willing to do that for a discount. And I think insurance companies have even explored, a few insurance companies have explored options for allowing you to put devices in your cars, which would track things like your speed, um, in order to give you discounts. So while they may not force you, they might provide very um, 
uh, incentives that are very difficult to turn away from. Yes. And, and you're touching on, on an issue that I was hoping our fourth panelist would be able to touch on. So Professor Alessandro Acquisti unfortunately had to uh, uh, call and said that uh, he caught the flu on his way back uh, from Europe where he was actually testifying, I believe, uh, with the European Commission on, on privacy issues. But one of the things that he's well known for is in fact work on what he refers to and what people refer to as cognitive and behavioral biases and, and the fact that uh, uh, you know, often short-term rewards and short-term considerations will trump perhaps any sort of uh, you know, consideration of longer term types of consequences that might be associated uh, with our behaviors or, or, or decisions. Would uh, any one of you feel comfortable perhaps uh, just talking a bit more about that? So I, I, I think um, you know, it's often the case that when we're trying to get something done or we want something, you know, we focus on the benefit that we're going to get from that thing in the immediate moment. And we're not thinking about the long-term consequences. And uh, privacy is an area where it's actually hard to think about the long-term consequences. Uh, it's, it's not obvious how the actions that I take today are going to lead to a privacy violation um, next week, next month, next year, even multiple years down the road. Um, it's not even clear to me um, how I would even figure that out because uh, it's, it's so um, difficult to understand what data is being collected and where it's going. And so, um, you know, when I go and I, I want to play that game, I want to go, you know, download that, that app from my bank so I can get my money deposited into my bank account right away, you know, I'm just going to go and I'm going to grab it. Uh, we've done studies where we've um, watched people install apps and you know, nobody stops and reads those little permissions things that come up on the screen. Um, I know personally, I usually don't even read them. You know, you just want to get on with, with, with what you're doing. And so um, we all are sort of reluctant to stop and think things through. And that, that bias is something that um, the companies that want to collect data from us are able to exploit to get us to, you know, take the free thing, take the fun thing, uh, move forward with that, and not stop and think about the long-term consequences. So I see several hands uh, raised in, in the back. Uh, the idea behind this format was that we're going to keep those questions for the end, but I'm happy to change in real time. And I think I saw a gentleman in the back who was first to raise his hand. I actually wanted to ask sort of the, the reverse question of this. What would happen if tomorrow everyone could throw a switch and prevent any of their data from being shared? What do you think would happen with that? So the, the question, uh, just in case this is uh, not uh, going through the microphone, so the question is, uh, what if uh, one day we had a switch that we could turn on that would effectively say, well, whatever data has been collected about me, that data is no longer available for people to process and to use. Uh, so anyone has, uh, wants to comment on that, Jason? So um, it's a very good question. And uh, my suspicion is that a lot of companies would probably shut down because, uh, first off, a lot of the apps wouldn't work anymore. And so you wouldn't be able to see like who your friends are or be able to share your current location or if you're even using Google Maps, they're getting your current location, but they're also showing your current location on the map, too. So they wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to offer services like that anymore. Uh, but then you'd also undercut a serious kind of incentive for trying to figure out how to deploy an app and make money off of it. Again, I mean, there's only so many ways by which you can make money off of these apps. You can either you know, pay the 99 cents or 3.99 or whatever it is. You can do a freemium model where it's sort of like you get some for free and then you get some, buy some extra in-app purchases. Or you do this advertising approach. And so cutting off that third approach, which most of the apps are, especially if you look at the top 100, then they're pretty much all the free apps where they're based on advertising. That pretty much cuts out an entire large segment. So I'd be a little bit reluctant to just go for that approach for that reason. And, and so I think Travis wants to add something. Go ahead. Yeah, just quickly. Um, if we look back at like the uh, FCRA, for example, credit reporting, um, I think if you were to, yeah, today you can go to your credit reporting agency and say, I would not like to share this financial information. Um, in credit reports, and that would essentially, essentially limit your access to loans, right? So today I think we're still in a very early period with these mobile apps. Um, it's not clear who wants the data, how the data is going to be monetized. There are examples, you know, with games and things like this. Longer term, it may be that insurance companies depend on that data to give you um, insurance. And if yeah. that is the case, and we may be looking, you know, more than just five years in the future, it would be very hard to turn the flow off, right? In, as is the case with credit reporting. So I think Lori has something to add also. Yeah, so I don't think um, it has to be all or nothing. Um, so I, I think that uh, in a scenario where, where we somehow turned off the flow of data, um, it's unlikely that it would 
turn it off in such a way that the, the um, consumer couldn't opt to allow some of the data to flow. Um, and so I think if something like this were to happen, companies would immediately start explaining the value proposition to their users and trying to convince them to voluntarily allow the data to keep flowing. Um, and so I don't think the internet would shut down. I don't think the companies would shut down. I think we would actually have a, um, a, a better conversation between companies and users in explaining what information was flowing and why. So clearly different views, and I think we've got another question here. Um, uh, I'm glad we're getting into the regulatory side, um, and, and what Lori just said about the value proposition is exactly where I want to go. I actually think that, that and maybe it's been explored in other work, that we are allowing a large deception uh, to occur to the consuming public, which <coughs> is not consistent with some other models of regulation. We know that these are not free apps. We know that it's actually a commercial trade. That is not being disclosed. You give us your data, and we get to use it in ways that we're not really disclosing to you, and in perpetuity, basically, and you get to play our game or whatever. I think all of this needs to, we've got to ban the word free, and we've got to start talking about it as a commercial trade that also has enough disclosure but not the kinds of disclosure that Lori has already criticized, quite rightly, for nobody's reading these policies. She has some ideas for how to render them more formulaic or in some way that we would instantly be able to see, is this one, is this someone I want to play with? And, um, and right now we're not there, but I think one of the first steps might be to ban the word free, because it's not free. It's, it's actually commercial value that's being exchanged. That, that's a very good point. And so th this sort of is uh, a good way of uh, moving on to the next set of questions that I wanted to address. So effectively, I think we've collectively decided that perhaps the next question that naturally uh, comes up has to do with uh, laws and regulations. And so you've mentioned the fact that uh, here in the US, our system is not quite are the same as the one you might find elsewhere. I mentioned Europe, but think also closer to home. Uh, Canada, for instance, would be another place where uh, the laws and regulations are uh, fairly different from uh, the system that we have uh, in place here today. And so uh, I've got a couple of questions I wanted to ask our panelists, and you know, feel free to broaden uh, your, your answer. But uh, this has to do with uh, the view sometimes that the public might have, people who are not necessarily following uh, you know, this, uh, what's going on in this space on a day-to-day -day basis, I think the, the public probably still has perhaps, uh, you know, this impression that the government is watching out for them, and, and perhaps that's true, or perhaps that's not, you might have different views about that, but is our existing legal and regulatory framework here in the U.S., in your view, sufficient, or is it the case that somehow additional elements might need to be introduced in, in some manner and, uh, and would that be potentially the solution to all the problems that we're talking about? Uh, so is anyone willing to take a stab at, at that question? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, so um, we, we don't really have much of an existing regulatory framework towards privacy in the United States. And this actually surprises most US consumers who assume that somebody is, is out there protecting them. Um, but in the US, we have some sector-specific privacy laws. So they apply specifically to healthcare or to financial data, telecommunications, or your video rental records are very well protected, in case you we're worried about that. Um, but, but we don't have um, comprehensive privacy regulation that's going to protect you all for, for uh, everything that you do. Um, and so I, I think that we actually do need more regulation in the privacy space. Um, the way that our um, regulatory agencies and Congress have been dealing with this for the past 15 years or so is that they've been pressing um, US industry to self-regulate. And we've seen a whole flurry of different self-regulatory organizations and guidelines and proposals and icons and all sorts of things like that. Um, and every few years, the industry gets together and says, we have a new privacy self-regulatory plan. And everybody says, yay, and they have a press conference. And then they go away, and really not much happens. And then a few years later, um, Congress or the FTC says to them, well, we seem to have a privacy problem. What is the industry going to do about it? And they, they come up with a new privacy self-regulatory plan. Um, and I think th this whole series of, um, of self-regulation, I think, has kept the problem from getting terribly, terribly worse. It's kept it in check a little bit, but it hasn't ever fully solved the problem. Uh, Travis, I think you want to add something? 
Sure. So um, as, as Lori notes, there's no comprehensive national privacy um, legislation regu regulation that governs things like mobile apps, for example. Um, there are some developments. So in California, there was the uh, recent law that was passed requiring <coughs> mobile app developers to post privacy policies. And it seems like something simple like that is just so obvious, right? But without the regulation, um, there's just no motivation necessarily for some of the small app developers to realize that privacy is a concern for, for their app. Um, in addition to that, there's been some work from the Attorney General in California to publish um, some regulatory guidelines, right? Now, these aren't regulations that say you must do this. These are guidelines that if the Attorney General is telling you, then chances are good if you do those things, maybe they won't come down on you so hard if they find out you didn't quite do it the way that they envisioned, right? So doing something is usually better than not doing anything at all. And then more recently, there's uh, legislation that's been proposed. Um, so if any of you are interested in legislation, I encourage you to go look at uh, Hank Johnson's website. He's the representative, one of the representatives down in Georgia who's thinking through some draft legislation on mobile privacy, um, particular f for apps, and there's some good guidelines in it. There are also some complicated wordings that technically would be hard to figure out, but um, those are just a couple highlights of things that are taking place right now. Uh, it sounded like Jason wanted to add something also. I would say th there's two really big kinds of technical and social challenges with respect to the law and regulation. One is that uh, even we as researchers don't know the best way of trying to communicate this kind of information to, to people. So even in an ideal situation where we have these apps that could do amazing things, we're not sure what the best way is to communicate while it's tracking this kind of data about you. The other thing that uh, also I think is very difficult is that researchers are discovering every single day new ways of inferencing um, things about you based on the data. So just an example, in our research group, we're looking at how do we infer that you're it looks like you're starting to become depressed. You have the early symptoms of undergoing uh, depression. And uh, we can do this based on location data, contact list data, communication, call log data, and so on. But that's something that's not really <coughs> obvious that you could actually do, but we think it's actually possible. Or you know, inferring lots of other kinds of behaviors about you. It's like where you're going, the kinds of things you like buying, and so on. All this stuff just based off of just little bits of data. And every single day, new researchers, uh, researchers are discovering new kinds of things about what we can infer about you. And that makes it really, really hard for the law to regulate because they don't know all the things that we can do. And in fact, we don't even know all the things. I mean, next year, we're going to even discover new kinds of things that we didn't think were even possible. And so that's going to be really, really hard for the law to try to keep up with. So the, it sounds like you're, you're, you're all advocating in, in some manner for perhaps uh, stricter laws and, and regulations in this space. But to play the devil's advocate, some people have argued that, you know, in, in a place like Europe, where you've got these uh, comprehensive laws that are cutting across the board, right, instead of being sector specific, uh, you know, if people had really followed uh, the rules of, of uh, the, the laws that were in place, uh, sites like Facebook, perhaps, and, and the mobile web would not necessarily have taken off. Uh, you know, as we all know, uh, those laws and regulations are not necessarily being applied very strictly uh, in Europe. It seems that these countries are perhaps now slowly waking up. But in effect, if people had adhered to these laws and, and regulations, it might have been a lot more difficult for you know, the new phenomena uh, that we're seeing in the context of the social and mobile web to effectively you know, take off as they have. And obviously, you look at Facebook, you look at uh, you know, the mobile app uh, economy, and uh, these sectors have created thousands, tens of thousands of jobs, right, over the past few years. So how do you respond to that? Or do you respond to that? Yeah, so I, I, I think the, the premise here is that um, if you had privacy regulation, everything, all these things would have to shut down. Um, and I don't think that that's the case. I think that if you had privacy regulation and it was enforced, um, these companies would have to find ways of protecting privacy. And right now, they have no incentive to find ways to protect privacy because nobody's telling them that they have to do it and their competitors aren't doing it. But if you level the playing field and you say, well, everybody who wants to compete is going to have to protect privacy, now all of a sudden there is a reason that people should invest in actually trying to protect privacy. So I, I think that it would not actually um, shut everything down, and it could be a good thing for the development of new privacy-enhancing technology. Would everyone agree with that, or, or do we have something to add? Yeah, something I would add, too, is that uh, from a developer standpoint, it's not even clear what the best practices are. So you know, if you're in computer security, you know you should be using SSL, you should know you should be using encryption, you know you should be doing certain kinds of things. 
But with respect to privacy, it's not even clear what the set of best practices are. And I think that makes it really hard to move forward. But I think that it doesn't matter even for Facebook or even like new kind of mobile apps, they should have some base level that we could all agree on. I think we don't know what that is yet, but there's probably some base level of things where, for example, you're not going to be posting it all online, you know, where anybody can access it. That's sort of like an obvious one. But if we can sort of figure out that, I think that would also go a long ways towards helping the entire kind of environment and ecosystem of developing these apps. So you're all computer science professors. Uh, that means you're all educators, and at the same time, you're saying there are no best practices. Uh, so when you're teaching in, in this area, how, how do you address that? What, what do you do about that? Well, I wouldn't say there's no best practices. I think it, what I would say is it's hard to articulate what the best practices are for new kinds of areas. So for example, like the old standby would be the fair information practices. These would be like the set of practices that were defined by, uh, based off of Alan Weston's work. So it'd be things like uh, you're only collecting a certain amount of data, you're using the data for what exactly is specified, uh, you have security, you have uh, some level of recourse in case things go wrong, data is up, kept up to date, and so on. So I mean, each of those still makes a lot of sense, but they're sort of like, how do you operationalize these high-level principles towards, okay, here's specifically what we should be doing as developers. There's a pretty big gap between the two. It's like, it's sort of like the 10 commandments. You have these <coughs> top-level commandments, but how do you actually execute them in practice? And that's sort of the gap that I'm worried about, which is how do you take these principles and apply them to this mobile space or to new areas that we haven't even imagined yet? So do, do you find that in general software engineers, I mean, the people behind many of these apps and you know, networks that we're talking about, do you, do you find that they, they have the right sort of training to actually you know, think about these things in that manner? My, here's my suspicion, and in fact, I'm trying to see if I can uh, hire some kind of undergrad to work on this this summer. Here's my suspicion is that most of the app developers out there who are collecting all this data, most of them are not evil. Right? And I, I think that's pr pretty much a given. Most people aren't evil. Uh, but I also suspect that most of them don't know what to do or what's the right thing to do, even if they, even if they had an idea of what to do. They don't know how to implement it in code, or they don't even know what the right thing to do is. So just as a trivial example, this is with respect to computer security. Uh, anyone who's ever used any kind of website, they know it should be HTTPS for a secure internet protocol, right? But I suspect that for Android development, and I've tried this myself in the past few weeks, it's actually really hard to go from regular internet communication to secure communication. It's sort of like there's a barrier to entry there. And I think it's that barrier to entry. The garden path is just do the easier thing. Just get the data, and we can start making money versus do the right thing, make sure it's secure. And that's sort of the gap that I think is actually pretty fascinating. I, and again, I suspect most of the developers aren't evil, but it's just it's so much easier to do the lazy thing. And there's no, again, there's not real clear set of best practices out there. And so I feel like if we could give, them to that, give that to them, we could do much better too. So in the spirit of full disclosure, you and I are close collaborators, and, and we've been looking at many mobile apps. And one of the things that we see over and over again is all these apps that collect location information, send that information, which is known as PII, back to the server without even encrypting yes. the data. And, and so that clearly is an example of what you're talking about. But then beyond that, uh, there are also all sorts of design issues, right, that people have to, in principle, tackle when, when they're looking at these new products, these new services that uh, are coming out all, uh, all the time and that effectively, you know, fuel growth and, and the economy here. Uh, so how, wh what do we do in terms of training people to, to reason about these? these types of issues. Lori, do you have something that you want to say about that? Yeah, yeah. So I, I think, um, you know, it, it's difficult to, to give people a list of do this, 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 and this, and it will always work. Um, but we can teach by example, by showing ways that we can improve the privacy um, in existing products, and then to reason about how you might apply this as you're developing something new that we haven't thought about before. And, and that's something that I've, I've used in my classes. And um, uh, we're actually here at Carnegie Mellon um, uh, designing a new master's program for privacy engineers and that's part of what we expect to be teaching um, next fall when when this program starts is to be basically take a, a group of people who are um, you know excellent uh, software developers software engineers um, uh, technologists and teach them kind of how to go from just building great systems to building great systems that actually protect privacy I think Travis wanted to add something also yeah definitely so um, you know, having in, in teaching design, um, one thing we do is we try and teach students how to analyze requirements, how to analyze designs, how to think through various trade-offs. Should I encrypt this data? What will be the impact on performance for my system? Um, 
you know, should I share this other data to monetize it with a third party? How will that help my business plan? So there are many different dimensions of this problem, uh, many of which will be covered by actually the curriculum in the MSIT Masters uh, for Privacy, but also in a course that's being developed for next spring uh, in 2014, which will specifically be looking at engineering privacy and software. So if you're interested in that topic, definitely look out for that course. That's a nice plug. And so this sort of uh, brings me to uh, the next topic. So in a way, we've, we've looked at uh, where we are today, we've identified problems and, and shortcomings, uh, but you're also all researchers uh, in this space, and, and so I'd like to give you a chance to perhaps talk about what you view as the biggest challenges, and I, I don't think that uh, any one of you will end up with the answer, it's only about changing the laws and regulations, and then we'll be done. So I'd like to give you a chance to uh, uh, tell the audience here uh, what you view as some of the biggest challenges in, in privacy. Uh, and uh, what it is that you're doing about that. And I will have to obviously ask you to be short as you uh, provide an answer to that uh, question because I'm sure each one of you can probably go on for at least an hour if I'm not careful. <coughs> Anyone? All right. So um, I, I think there are many big challenges, um, and I can't work on all of them. So the, the, the one corner of this problem um, that I'm focusing on is how to communicate with people about privacy, uh, how to make sure that they understand the privacy issues um, before they download an app or access a website or provide personal information. Um, so uh, we've been working on this um, with my students um, for several years now. Um, one of the things that, that we've uh, uh, tried is, is the notion of having something called a privacy nutrition label. Um, nutrition labels are very common on foods and they allow people to understand what they're eating before they eat it. And it's not that we all um, study them every time before we take a bite, and it's not that we've all stopped eating junk food because of them, um, but because these, these labels are available, they give us the opportunity when we want to, to choose the healthier foods, um, or to have uh, you know, the journalists you know, cover stories about the most unhealthy drinks in America or whatever, and draw our attention to some particularly bad problems. And so we've been trying to apply that same approach to privacy information to provide it in a standardized format in a place that people will always know where to look um, to make it easy to compare the privacy policies on mul multiple websites. Um, so <coughs> we've done that, that some of that work for um, websites. Now we're starting to look at apps and looking at ways that we can provide similar standardized notices for apps that are going to be um, uh, easy for people to understand. And what, what's really important is not just coming up with these ideas, but actually testing them with people and finding out um, whether they actually help people and make a difference. That, that was actually uh, very much uh, on, on time. Uh, uh, do you want to see if you can do the same? Sure, I'll try. So, um, so we have probably, you know, we're looking at two problems in my research group. One is to, um, in particular, across the space of privacy regulation that exists, um, there's increasingly technical requirements uh, being stated in the regulations that developers, for example, could focus on. Some of these get so technical as they say you have to use this type of encryption. Um, many are about notices, many are about consent, the type of consent and when to supply consent uh, to a consumer. And so one of our goals is to try and aggregate and distill all of these different requirements um, into a single standard, let's say, or a standard that offers many different pathways, depending on what your organization's doing. Are you, do you have users in this country and that country? And if so, well, then what's the union, for example, of the regulations in those two jurisdictions? A second project was kind of related, has to do with looking at privacy policies and privacy um, and other types of documents, like terms of use and terms of service documents and um, application developer guidelines, for example, that basically assign different rights and obligations and permissions to various stakeholders within this community about how they can use data. Because unlike the old desktop web where you just have people logging into a single service and having an exchange with that service, we're now seeing that there's a lot of integration taking place. So you have mobile phone manufacturers, app developers, you have uh, third-party advertisers, all working within this data space. And the challenge um, for each of these companies is to make sure that those other parties are actually uh, conforming to the policy, to policies and contracts they have in place. And so we're looking at ways to analyze these policies, identify rights and obligations, formalize them, and then detect conflicts using tools. Because at the end of the day, we're trying to develop tools that we can get to uh, developers. OK. And, and, and so um, Jason, why don't you tell us what you're doing in the mobile and social web as far as privacy is concerned? 
Okay, so uh, I'll tell you about one project that uh, Norman and I have been working on together. And uh, the basic idea is looking at people's expectations of privacy with respect to these apps. So uh, as an example, most people don't expect Angry Birds to collect your location data, but in reality, it actually does. And so that's an example of a big gap between uh, expectation and reality. Whereas if I said, you know, Google Maps collects your location data too, it's like, well, duh, that's obvious because it's showing my current location, so that's pretty, so you don't actually have to communicate that as strongly as the other one because people already know that. And so what we've been doing is we've been using a combination of crowdsourcing techniques and a lot of um, inspections of these applications to try to figure out what are the gaps in, in between people's expectations. So uh, this, we've seen a lot of funny ones. So for example, people are highly surprised that flashlight apps collect your location data. But anything dealing with location data and maps, people are not very surprised at at all. And so we've been trying to scale up this analysis. We've crawled about 100,000 apps, and we're trying to uh, create models of this to try to predict what people's privacy concerns would be. So an example might be, let's say that every app starts out with a privacy score of 5. Uh, if you are a game and you use location data, subtract 0.3. If you're a well-known brand name, add point two, and so on. So based off of this, we can try to figure out why is it that we guess that your privacy or your app probably have a low privacy score or high privacy score. And on top of that, we can also help application developers in terms of understanding why do we give you a low or high privacy score. So they can also try to rectify the problems. So I mean, we, we've talked about regulation and, and laws, and then we've talked about research, and, and so you've got this dichotomy, dichotomy between. We can fix everything with, with laws and regulations. We can fix everything with uh, technologies. But what I'm hearing here is more that really these two things are complementary. And so uh, what are you doing and, and what can be done or should we do something in terms of perhaps informing uh, policymakers? So how do these technologies that you're working on potentially impact what the right solutions might be from a regulatory or, or legal perspective? Are there things that we may want to do differently because new technologies might be available? Uh, is, is this something that uh, you view as, as your responsibility also as researchers? Yeah, I, I think that as researchers, we do have a role in informing uh, the public policy process here um, because it is it is a process and, and it is um, uh, very, very much uh, ongoing and in need of actual data. Um, so right now, um, as far as app privacy goes, there, there's actually um, in Washington something called the multi-stakeholder process that's been convened by the U.S. Department of Commerce where they are bringing together app developers, um, uh, service providers, consumer advocates, all sorts of people to try to figure out uh, how they can come up with some sort of guidelines and notifications for consumers about app privacy issues. And uh, what, what's going on there is they have these meetings and the consumer groups throw out some ideas. Oh, you should give uh, consumers this whole laundry list of all the data you're going to collect. And the app developers say, there's no way we can fit that on the screen. We should put little tiny um, icons instead. And you know, the media reports, it's a war between icons and words. You know, which should it be? Uh, but nobody actually has any data or any idea of which is going to be more effective. And so I view that you know, the work that my students are doing actually can be very informative to that process. And so we're trying to make it available um, as part of the process to try, to try to actually help them move towards making a decision that, that actually makes sense based on the data. Okay. Does anyone else want to add something? Or you pretty much agree with that view? I would I'd just add one more quick thing, which is that um, the other role that we could also have, too, as researchers in general is just to help a lot of the congressional staffers and representatives understand what the challenges are. Because um, a lot of the congressional staffers I met, they're very smart people, but they don't have strong technical backgrounds. And so it's sort of like there's a big black box, and they don't know quite what's going on inside of it. And so part of our job is also to help explain you know, what's going on, why are certain things happening, why are certain things not happening, and so on. Because the danger is that they might try to legislate things that aren't possible, or it might be legislating things that aren't good, or so on. So it's part of our job to make sure that you know, we explain these as clearly as possible. And, and the challenge with laws and regulations by, by default is that it's always been a war behind, right? So you talked about the, the sectoral regulations, right? So video rentals are well protected, even though I don't think too many of us are renting videos uh, anymore, at least certainly not in the way it was envisioned uh, originally. And, and, and so clearly uh, providing that perspective to lawmakers, helping them understand where this entire area might be headed uh, is uh, certainly very critical. There are also, I think, options that are being developed here that uh, could potentially reshape essentially the, 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 the landscape and help potentially regulators identify sort of opportunities that are providing better trade-offs than the ones they might be aware of. 
So I'd like to get to the lighter side of, of this uh, panel, if, if there is one. So I thought uh, that I would talk about one of these emerging scenarios. So those of you who don't know, uh, there is this uh, uh, new mobile social networking app that has uh, gained quite a bit in, in popularity. I don't have the latest figures, but it still certainly seems to, it seem, it seems to be catching on uh, very fast. It's called Snapchat. And uh, the idea behind Snapchat, for those of you who haven't used it yet, is that uh, you know, there are perhaps things that you want to send to your friends in a manner that's perhaps not very different from uh, the way in which you use Twitter or SMS, except that perhaps you, know, you don't necessarily want this information to just remain accessible forever. And so what Snapchat does is that it enables you to send these uh, pictures and, and comments uh, but then they get erased within a few seconds. So they're basically popping up and disappearing. And, and uh, that seems to be very appealing uh, to many users. And uh, uh, some articles that have been written about this have uh, talked about uh, the <coughs> fact that this is just a reflection of the fact that perhaps people care more about privacy and they don't necessarily want to leave trails behind. Think about you know, those pictures that people post on Facebook a few years ago, perhaps when they were in college, like some of the people in this room, and then, uh, you know, it was all fun, and they uh, thought they were really impressing their friends, and then a few years later, they're looking for a job, and those pictures come back to haunt them. And so Snapchat, perhaps, uh, is something like Snapchat the solution to that? I don't exactly know. But I thought I would invite our panelists to perhaps just uh, briefly comment on Snapchat. So what does this tell us in, in terms of <coughs> privacy? Uh, you know, and feel free to, to say what comes to mind. You know, do you feel that this is an important development or not? Uh, are users, do we, users really understand what they're doing? Uh, you know, whatever you want to say, uh, I'd like to give you the floor and uh, give you a chance to comment on, on uh, one, of those, one of those recent developments. Anyone? Yes, I'll, Travis? I'll try to get us started. So, um, so I, think it, I think it's too early to tell whether or not Snapchat achieves the goals that it set out to achieve, and it's too early to tell really what the goals are. But um, I think in part what it says to us is that you know people want to be forgotten to some extent, right? They want certain pieces of data about themselves to um, not carry on in perpetuity. Uh, but the problem is, from a software engineering perspective, you know, how do you guarantee that data is deleted? So once the data is received, once the image is received on the recipient's phone, it's on the phone. And the only thing that protects that data is software. And software, by its very nature, what makes it valuable is that it can be changed. And so if either the manufacturer of the software simply didn't write it in the way to protect those images so that they would be deleted and not recoverable, or was it that somebody modified the application so that the images could then be copied and sent off through a back channel? We won't really know about uh, you know, the extent of whether or not those are possibilities yet until maybe more time comes around. But I think in the least, it's telling other companies right, that aren't even in the business that Snapchat is in that consumers want a way to erase their past. And so companies like Facebook could look at this and say, well, maybe there's an opportunity here um, to allow people to filter their posts or delete posts so that posts uh, never come back, right? Um, other companies that collect data and share data could also offer some similar technologies. So, so are these technologies effectively misleading users and tempting them to perhaps share things that using existing technologies they would not have shared, but know that they've got this illusion that somehow it's all going to potentially disappear they feel more comfortable and they go even one step beyond in sharing things. Is that what is happening here in some ways? I think in some ways it is happening, although I think even before Snapchat, I think a lot of users assumed that a lot of their communications were ephemeral. Um, we find that, especially with young people, um, you know, people wonder, like, why are they just typing, you know, hi, and, you know, just random bits of, that seem like just kind of dribble. And, and the reason is because they're viewing it as kind of their stream of consciousness. If I was just hanging out with my friends, these are the things I would say. And they think about it that way, and they think about it as ephemeral, and it's not part of their permanent record and it's just going to disappear. Uh, where they're wrong is, is that it doesn't disappear. Um, and so I think there is actually a great hunger for the technology to actually meet the expectations of the users. Um, and Snapchat, uh, I think, is an attempt to actually meet those expectations. Um, the problem, though, is that it's not clear that it actually does. Um, and perhaps it will make those users who, who uh, maybe held back a little bit not hold back, because now they're like, ah, now I have the technology that lets me do what I want. 
And I think a really interesting issue too is if you look at how humans have evolved, we were evolved for the here and now. So you know, I can see all the people here in front of the audience, and I can see your reactions. I can modulate what I'm saying and so on. But I'm also being recorded, which means that what I'm saying will be shifted in time and space at a place that won't be, or a situation not of my choosing. And so I don't necessarily know what that situation will be like. And that's really what the challenge is, because again, humans are just not very good at doing that. And so maybe there will be more kinds of technologies like that. But I suspect that you know, the people who wanted to share uh, salacious things of themselves probably would have done it anyways. <laughs> I, I don't think that is really that it's incentivizing them to do it. OK. Uh, yes, go ahead. So I, I think you guys have a, a much harder problem in the sense that the notion of privacy is changing. I think if you 20 years ago, everybody had a similar model of what privacy is. And now, I'm one of those guys who reads those shrink wrap agreements. I suspect I'm in the minority. <laughs> See if you care is what you sign from a point of view shrink wrap agreements. I bet most people don't know that. On the other hand, my kids' uh, friends post stuff that I might not even tell Norman. I know Norman and trust him quite a bit. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess the question is, um, you know, are we fighting up the battle in the sense of we don't even have a societal agreement on what privacy is about? Uh, and, you know, is it still too early to try to pass laws or, or create technology that addresses this moving target? So is, is privacy an absolute or is it something else? And, and if it's something else, something that evolves over time, what does this mean in terms of the discussion we're having here today? What does this mean? Yes, Travis. So I feel like we need an anthropologist or a sociologist or a psychologist on the panel, but, uh, but unfortunately. You play that role. No, I'll try. <laughs> um, so I think privacy is changing. I think that uh, it comes down to complex notions of, and this is what an anthropologist would probably say, power and power dynamics. So if you feel as though you can, say, post an image about yourself where there would be no ability for a third party to gain power over you, you might freely do that. Um, on the other hand, it's hard to know who can get power and who can't. So I think when we started reading newspaper articles about how companies were you know, before they hired somebody, they were looking for information about them online in order to sway their decision, usually towards a negative decision. That was an example where uh, the individual lost control, right, very much in the same way that Jason's talking about, where that image gets out to another party and then they can exercise some control over it. Maybe eventually we'll have laws and regulations, for example. That might be part of the solution that says when you're making a decision, you can only use this kind of information. Though we still have suspicions today that even though we have laws that protect special classes, that they're not actually always enforced, right? There's ways to work within the ambiguity so that you can exercise a decision about somebody um, and then get this negative outcome. So, so I, I think in ways, culture is going to change, uh, technology is going to change, regulation is going to change, and we're always going to be stuck in this battle of trying to find the right balance, right, so that people feel comfortable and willing to share ideas. Well, the ultimate rule is that I had a friend who typed 30 years ago, never type anything personal into a time sharing system and later <laughs> added the words or a network to that rule, and, and ultimately that's the only way to really protect yourself. Right? Mm. So the, there are a few paranoids still out there, and maybe they're the <laughs> wisest people among us. But they're the minority, I'm afraid. So um, I, I'd like to pick on, on, on uh, pick up on, on what you just said, unless Jason wants to add something. So um, and uh, perhaps uh, put Laurie on, on the spot. So if if uh, and she doesn't know yet what I'm talking about, but uh, if if there are no absolutes and it's if it's so difficult to really identify, you know, what is acceptable when it comes to to privacy, uh, when you have a project like the one you have, Laurie, that's looking at nudging users towards privacy uh, you know, and developing technologies that will hopefully entice people to think more carefully and make better decisions. What does better mean in that context? And how do you design systems like that? Uh, how can you even argue ethically that you, know, you have the right to do these kinds of things? Yeah, yeah so, that, so that's a, a tough question. Um, uh, I, I didn't um, mention uh, previously too much about our, our nudging project, where we're, we're right now trying to come up with, um, with little nudges we can insert uh, into Facebook or Twitter or other places um, that will stop you before you post something that might be too personal or something that might be seen um, by more people than, than you want to see it. Um, so, uh, you know, imagine you're typing in Facebook and um, pictures of your friends who might see it uh, start popping up and you, and you see, you know, a picture of your boss who you forgot you were friends with or something like that and you go, ooh, better not say that just now. Um, 
So, uh, you know, there, there's a value judgment to be made as to, you know, how much should we nudge people? When, when should we choose to nudge them? Um, what behaviors should we try to change? Uh, maybe uh, as, uh, I guess, um, you know, the, the, the Facebook um, founders and, and have been known to say that, that uh, you know, all the sharing that they promote actually um, makes the world a better place. It makes us all more aware of, of uh, other people's um, feelings and needs and it brings us all together. And so, you know, maybe we shouldn't be shutting that down. You know, that, that's, that's a good thing. Um, and, and so it, it is difficult to kind of make those decisions. Um, I think the, the approach that we've taken in our project is to try to um, uh, kind of counter some of the nudges that are already built into these systems that promote sharing um, to kind of uh, uh, give people a fair chance. So um, I, I want to be able to make a decision. And I should be able to decide share or not share. And if people are nudging me to share, I think giving them a nudge on the other side that says maybe don't share um, kind of balances things out and, and let, lets people decide. I, I think if we um, don't start pushing back through um, these sorts of nudges, through legislation um, and whatnot, um, you know, we have what's been referred to as a downward spiral. Um, you know, over time, we will lose privacy. Um, and uh, you could argue that, you know, maybe that's just inevitable. Maybe it's a good thing. Maybe that's just the natural course of, of things. Um, but I have a sense that, that it's not and that, that we shouldn't be sort of plummeting away from privacy and that pushing back and trying to um, maintain some of our privacy is probably going to help us in the long run. So I was hoping you'd touch also on the concept of regret which we've used basically as a proxy. So uh, again, in the spirit of full disclosure, we're actually collaborators on, on this project. Uh, but we've also looked at regret. So if someone regrets some decisions at some point, uh, then perhaps it makes sense to say, well, in the future, perhaps I can try to reduce regret. And uh, not everyone will regret the same things, which is obviously a challenge when it comes to privacy. Uh, so for instance, in the early days, we were looking, for instance, at tweets and looking for bad language in tweets and thought that perhaps that would be sort of a, a good indicator that perhaps uh, you know, the user getting ready to send that tweet should be nudged. But we've come to realize that a lot of people don't mind using bad language and will not regret having used it. And so clearly, it's more complex than that. But there are potentially some metrics. That we can that we can uh, look at. Right, right, and so we we have um, collected thousands of examples um, from people of things that they self-report to us that they've regretted uh, sharing on Twitter or on Facebook, um, and so we've used that as kind of a starting point to say, okay, well, what are the things that people are regretting, and um, and those are the sorts of things that they probably most would have liked to have been nudged to not do, and so therefore it's not coming only from our own experience, but from the experience of thousands of people that that we interviewed and surveyed. Well, what about so, things that they should have regretted but didn't? <laughs> <laughs> that too. <laughs> yes. So uh, we're hoping, exactly, we're hoping that at this point, having uh, listened to our panelists for about an hour, you feel like you have a lot of things that you would like to add or at least perhaps ask or, or panelists. And so I saw a hand in the back. I just want to add more of a, a comment. Regarding to the Snapchat, we talked about how well, somebody might hack the system. I think you need to take a, a more holistic approach of there's not just going to be a single solution to that. For example, technology says, you know, they developed that to say this should be deleted. So if you send me a picture via Snapshot and, and it's known that that was supposed to be deleted and I hacked the system and I keep a copy of that and then I distribute it someplace, then you take a legal recourse and sue me because I violated that. So, so if, you, if you look only, well, technologically we can't solve the problem, but if you take a wider view, you may say, well, we may be able to, to solve the problem with, with other uh, solutions. And, and this touches also on laws and regulations, yeah. again, because, for instance, some people in Europe have argued that you should have that right, right? Because you could always ask someone something, but it doesn't mean that they've got to abide by what, by, by, by what you requested. But there are certainly some people who've essentially argued that you know, people should have the right to say, you should erase, you should delete my information, I should have the right to be forgotten. and so. Uh, do we have people on, on the panel who would like to comment on that? 
Yeah, I, I just um, wanted to add that, that I, I think that um, privacy by technology and privacy by policy do go hand in hand. And I, and I think there are very few privacy protection mechanisms that are either all technology or all policy. We definitely um, see that interplay. Um, I think it also can be argued that, that sometimes you don't even need that enforcement mechanism. You just need that communication, um, that, that people will send out a photo um, <coughs> assuming their friends realize that they don't want it to be forwarded, but their friends didn't didn't realize that. Um, and just even having a note on the bottom that said, don't forward, might be enough to get them not to forward in some cases. Do we have other questions or comments from the audience? So maybe this, yes, go ahead. I think there's a lot of chatter about big data and data analytics um, currently. Um, and I think it's only going to get bigger. I'd love your views on both sort of the benefit side and the downside of big data. Um, I'm struck by the fact that the 1000 Genome Project, they just figured out how to de-anonymize that data set. And after all the, uh, uh, all the assurances that people would remain anonymous, over time, my question is, is even if we put the privacy labels on, over time do we erode those controls because of big data and correlation and analytics? So, so, so in principle, uh, in, in many countries, uh, privacy laws come with restrictions also in terms of not just what you collect, but for what purpose. The use of that data, and there are provisions in, in many uh, places against uh, frivolous uh, data collection, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And that clearly ties to uh, the data mining uh, point that, that you're raising here. So do, do you have something that uh, you would like to, to say about that? Or are we, yes, go ahead. OK, so I, I don't think anyone, um, that I work with believes in de-identification, that it's possible. Um, there's always the suspicion that eventually you can just combine the data set with another data set. You can reveal the people, right, who the data sets describe. Um, yeah, I, you know, this is a tough one because I think right now we're still in the early days and we're trying to understand what is the utility of having all this data? Um, what can it help us do? And there's optimists um, who say, well, the data can really help us understand um, how certain correlations with your behavior affect your health, for example, right? Um, the data might be able to suggest new interventions that we could use to make neighborhoods safer, right, to reduce crime, for example. Um, and the risk is that, in addition, once you understand certain attributes about people, you can also use knowledge about those attributes to um, say, direct their behavior, right? Whether it's targeted advertising to try and pull their attention away from something that they're already looking at to direct their attention somewhere else, um, or other sort of malicious forms of, the pessimists would say, malicious forms of um, manipulation, potentially, right? I don't think we know all, all, the, all the possible outcomes, so I think we just need to proceed cautiously. We need to hold up examples of good big data as well as examples of, say, worst case big data, right? Um, it's still pretty early. That would be the sort of message that you'd expect coming out of the School of Computer Science, <laughs> where we're in the business of innovating, but hopefully cautiously. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I'd like to uh, perhaps move on to uh, the last part of this panel, and this is where we're going to slowly wrap up. So I'd like to go back to, to my uh, question, which was obviously a, a fairly light question, and give our panelists also a chance to perhaps uh, add any uh, final thoughts to, uh, uh, to uh, the theme of, of this panel. So the question, if you remember, was uh, do the social and mobile web mark the end of privacy? Uh, and so uh, would you like to perhaps uh, conclude with a few final thoughts on, on, on that theme? Do you see this as uh, you know, all being that uh, downward spiral that, uh, spiral that uh, Laurie was talking about? Or uh, are we seeing uh, a more hopeful future where perhaps some of the technologies and uh, legislative uh, proposals that we talked about might eventually emerge and, and uh, make things better for us? I should start? No, who should start? Oh, oh who should start? <laughs> Whoever is willing. So, okay. Okay. I'll go ahead and start. So I think it won't mark the end of privacy, but it's going to be sort of 
uh, beginning of new conceptualizations of privacy, which have always evolved. So, you know, going back to Philip's question about, you know, changing conceptions of privacy, if you looked at the, the original, one of the earliest definitions, the right to be let alone, that came out because of photography, where people had to stand still for like 30 seconds, basically, and then that led to other kinds of people's worries about privacy. Or if you look at uh, how the telephone, the original handheld, not the handhelds, but the, uh, the landline telephones, when it first deployed, people were worried about how you might be able to get uh, bad music, people could call you at any time, and you might also get wireless germs as well, too. Uh, and so I've also heard about RFIDs, people are worried about RFIDs being tracked from outer space, which is not possible unless they want to microwave the entire United States. <laughs> uh, but I mean, these are examples of how the conceptualization of privacy have to evolve over time, where it's partly based off of fear, partly based about misconceptions of the technology, partly about real things that technology can do, and as we try to figure out what's the right things and the wrong things to do with technology. And also, you know, what does the social kinds of, what are social interactions change as well too. So just to give you a concrete example of this, you know, 10 years ago, if you had told me that Doobie is this awesome site where people could list all their friends and they could post photos and t uh, tell people what they ate for breakfast, I would say, that's the stupidest idea I've ever heard. <laughs> but yet, you know, they have over a billion people using these things. And probably more if you count Twitter and Facebook as well too. And so, I mean, that's an example of people's changing conceptualizations of privacy too. And, you know, as we get more used to the technology, as we understand more the boundaries, as we see mistakes being made, as we see celebrities in the news of things going wrong, we will also adjust our behaviors too. So I think it definitely was not the end of it, but it's the beginning of a really interesting era. And uh, you know the old Chinese saying, when you live in interesting times, well, that's definitely where we are right now. Well, thank you very much, Jason. Um, sure. Travis? So, um, so I think in the 90s, we probably were looking at websites and we were saying things like, oh my gosh, none of these sites have privacy policies. And if only they had privacy policies, then people would really understand what the problem is. And, um, and I think, you know, having gone through that era and reflecting on it, we've actually come forward quite a bit. And I remember in 2005, one of my colleagues who works at an industry research lab said to me, you know, we were talking about this and we really think privacy is probably dead. Right? And he was reflecting on the fact that the privacy policy problem was, you know, there are so many great solutions for it. And then a year later, mobile phones, smartphones in particular, became very prolific, right? The Apple iPhone came out, the Android came out. And we realized that we could use technology in ways that we had never perceived before. We started reflecting back on all these uh, concerns we had about privacy in new ways. And privacy policies, again, became a problem, uh, but a new kind of problem. So my sense is that uh, things are very exciting right now. And going forward, we're going to see a number of technological changes that challenge us in ways that will require us to adapt as human beings, require us to adapt our legal system, like we've always done for hundreds of years. So I'm actually quite an optimist. I don't think uh, that anything that's negative will persist long enough for some of the smart people, like around here, um, where they wouldn't reflect on it and say, wait a minute, we maybe need to approach this differently, technologically or legally. Uh, and so with that, I think I'll just uh, remain an optimist and, and, and say that no, it's not dead yet. It's always nice to finish on an optimistic note, unless Laurie wants to change that. No, 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 no. We're, we're all too happy today. It's privacy day. Uh, no, I, I, I think that there, there is a risk of that downward spiral, um, but I think that as long as we keep having meetings like this, and as long as, as we keep um, kind of staying alert to uh, the, the dangers that, that the new technologies pose and the risks that they pose, and we keep having these discussions, I think society will help kind of keep things in check, and we will have the checks and balances that we need, and we will, we will continue to innovate, and we will continue to have cool, new, wonderful things, but we also <coughs> will not um, uh, get rid of all of our privacy. So I, I'd like to think that, that privacy Privacy is not dead, and it's, it's not going to be dead, um, uh, but, it, but it will take uh, hard work on all of our part. I think that's a very nice conclusion. So essentially, it's a very challenging space, and as long as there are people like us and, and others who worry about the technical and policy implications, and as long as we keep on watching, then hopefully collectively we'll be able to keep things somewhat under control. But I'd like to give a big round of applause uh, to our panelists. Thank you very much.